welcome to Watch Your Life. This is session four and we're looking today at battling temptation. Now, when you became a Christian, you turned from sin, but the impulse to sin remains in you. So to be a Christian is to engage in a lifelong battle against sin and against temptation. And my aim in this session is to encourage you in that battle. By God's grace, this is a battle in which you can prevail, but you need to know how to fight. Now, I want to begin by quoting nine verses of Scripture, and they all have one thing in common. They all teach that we need to be actively engaged in our battle against sin. Notice in each of these verses who is to act. Mark 14 and verse 38, Jesus says, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now notice who's to act. We are. We're to watch and we're to pray. Romans chapter 8 and verse 13. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So you see who's to put to death the deeds of the body. We are. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Or Ephesians 6, 11, Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. See, this is something that we are to do. We're to put on the armour of God. Similarly, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Or Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Or 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you have made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now you see who's to fight and who's to take hold? We are. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And lastly, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Now, do you see that the language of the New Testament is proactive when it comes to your battle with sin and temptation? God calls you to watch and pray and fight sin and flee temptation. So when it comes to your battle with sin, don't say, let go and let God. You've got to trust God and get going. Because you see, God has given you power. The Holy Spirit lives within you. God has put you in a position to fight against the temptations that you face. The Holy Spirit works in you and with you, but never without you. Now, how are you going to fight sin and resist temptation in your life? Well, I want to give you a very simple strategy. Know it, stalk it, kill it. Here's the strategy for fighting sin. You've got to start with knowing it. And that means that you identify your primary battles. James says each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. See, the temptations we face are tied to our own flesh. And that means that the distinctive battles that you face are to some extent rooted in your temperament. All Christians are tempted, but we're not all tempted in the same way. So knowing yourself is of huge importance in living the Christian life. Think about it. David was an impulsive person and his temptation with Bathsheba reflected his impulsiveness. Jonah was very different. He was an introverted person and his temptation to sulk outside Nineveh, well, that reflected his introversion. And Hezekiah was an extrovert. 
I mean, he liked to make an impression and his temptation to show his riches, well, that came right out of his extrovert temperament. Now, think about it. A person who is meticulous may be tempted to hold a grudge or not to forgive. A person who is naturally cautious, well, they may be tempted to live in fear rather than faith. So become a student of your own heart. Get to know the special temptations that lurk inside the framework of your own temperament. Are you the kind of person who might be tempted to control or to withdraw? Are you the kind of person who might be tempted to resent or to rebel? Ask God to help you see what you're up against. Psalm 139 Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So you have to identify your primary battles. And then note your most vulnerable times. One of these is likely to be when you're tired. The disciples were tired in the Garden of Gethsemane late at night. The whole week had been exhausting since they had arrived in Jerusalem and that was after a hundred mile walk from Galilee. I don't know about you, but when I'm tired, I don't see things clearly. I'm less careful with what I say, less patient, more irritable, more easily provoked. When I'm tired, I'm more vulnerable to temptation. So when you're tired, watch and pray. Another time when you're especially vulnerable is when a friend has failed. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But notice what comes next. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Never underestimate the effects in your life that come from the choices made by one of your friends. The disciples of Jesus were tempted after Judas walked out from the Last Supper. And if you have a friend who has abandoned the faith, you watch yourself. This is a vulnerable time for you. If you have a friend who engages in some deception, what he or she has done, it gets into your mind and it makes you more vulnerable to the same temptation. Has someone you know fallen into sin? Well, watch and pray so that what has happened to someone else doesn't become a stumbling block to you as well. So identify your primary battles. You've got to know what you're fighting against. Note your most vulnerable times and then study your past experience. You know, reflecting on your own past failures is a great way to avoid repeating them. Study the times when you failed in the past. When did that happen? What could you have done differently that might have led to a different outcome? The defence on a football team will watch the reruns of a touchdown they've conceded over and over and over again. They're going to analyse how the play might have been stopped because they want to do better next time. Learn from your defeats so next time you will prevail. Listen to how John Owen describes this. This, he says, is how men deal with their enemies. They search out their plans ponder their goals, and consider how and by what means they have prevailed over them in the past. Then they can be defeated. So here's where you must begin. Know what you're fighting against. Now, in our last session, we looked together at how you can use your daily Bible reading to identify hidden sins that may be lurking in your life. You may also find that a trusted friend can help you. I'll never forget the first time that I plucked up courage to ask my wife to help me with this. We were on a journey driving in our van and I said to her, you know, I've got something to ask you and I want you to help me. Can you identify one sin that you think I should be fighting against more strongly in my life? And she thought about it for a while 
And then very sweetly, she said, can I tell you too? <laughs> well, what she identified was really helpful to me. You can't fight a battle unless you know what you're fighting against. Now, the Apostle Paul describes this using the analogy of boxing. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest, after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, you see what he's saying? I don't want to put myself in a position where I am disqualified from ministry. And I know that I'm in a fight against sin and temptation, so I don't fight as one beating the air. See, a man beating the air, well, he just exhausts himself without ever landing a punch. And when that happens, of course, he's going to be taken out by his opponent. No, in boxing, you have to land your punches. And that means that you have to keep your opponent clearly in view. You have to move toward him. You have to aim at him. And you have to weaken him by many blows. Now, that's how you have to think about your fight against sin. So what are two sins that you need to fight against more strongly in your life right now? When you know what you're up against, then you'll be able to engage in the battle. Know it. That's the first part of the strategy. Second, stalk it. Now, stalking is simply the way in which you move from knowing your sin to being able to kill it in your life, to put it to death. Stalking means that you get in a position where you can see sin's movement in your life so that you're ready to take action against it. Now, don't underestimate the importance of this. If you become aware of a particular area of sin in your own life and you don't move in on it, well, you can be sure that it will grow. Now, one way to strengthen your resistance to sin is to look at where it would lead you. James says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now, do you see that every sin has a life cycle? First it's conceived, then it's born, then it grows, and then it brings death. So when you're faced with a particular temptation, ask yourself, what fruit would this bring in my life if I allowed it to grow? John Owen says, ask envy what it aims at. Murder and destruction are its natural conclusion. Set yourself against it as if it had already surrounded you in wickedness. Now, do you see what he's saying? Envy might seem like, ah, oh, just a little thing, just a little bit of envy in your heart or in your mind. But Owen says, ask where it's going. Look at its trajectory. Ask envy what it aims at. If you take envy all the way down the line, its natural conclusion is that you would try and eliminate the person who you are envying. Murder and destruction are its natural conclusion. So you've got to set yourself against that little envious thought as if it had taken you all the way down the line to its logical and horrible conclusion. Now, in a similar vein, he says... Every unclean thought or glance would be adultery if it could. Every covetous desire would be oppression. And every unbelieving thought would be atheism. You see, you have a little unbelieving thought in your mind or in your heart. And if you were to follow it all the way down the line, well, it would take you to become an atheist. You wouldn't believe in God at all. So he says, sin's expression is modest in the beginning, but once it gains a foothold, it continues to take further ground and presses on to greater heights. So you've got to know what you're up against. Know it. 
You've got to see how it's operating in your life, where it's trying to take you, where it's going. Know it, stalk it. And then here's the third part of the strategy. Kill it, kill it. John Owen says, always be killing sin or it will be killing you. Now that's straight out of Romans chapter 8 and verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now three observations from this very important text. First, sin dies slowly. So putting sin to death is a process, not an event. And the process involves weakening the power of a particular sin or temptation in your life. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. See, God's grace trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And every time you say no to the flesh, you weaken its power. And that's a process that happens over time. Sin dies slowly. And that, of course, is the point of what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now you read that verse and you think, oh well, it sounds like this is all now done. But notice the word crucified. Is crucifixion a fast death or a slow death? Well, of course, crucifixion is a painfully slow death. And when Paul says that we have crucified the flesh, he means that it is dying, not that it's dead. The flesh is gradually being weakened. And every time you say no to a particular temptation, you weaken its power in your life. Now, of course, the opposite is also true. Every time you say yes to a particular temptation, you increase its power in your life. So you have to stay actively engaged in this battle. Sin dies slowly. And so the battle continues. The impulse to sin will remain in your flesh throughout your Christian life. This is a lifelong battle that we're talking about. Now, for sure, the particular temptations that you're fighting against will likely change over time, but the battle continues throughout all of your life in this world. Our battle with remaining sin, well, it's like pulling weeds in a garden. The more you pull them, the more you'll subdue them. But you have to keep at it. And if you give up, well, the weeds will soon return. John Owen says, Sin will not die except by being gradually and constantly weakened. Spare it and it heals its wounds and recovers its strength. Let no man think to kill sin with few easy or gentle strokes. He who has once smitten a serpent, if he follow not on his blow until he be slain, may repent that he ever began the quarrel. And so he who undertakes to deal with sin and pursues it not constantly to death. I love the picture that he uses there. Can you imagine someone poking a snake with a stick? And all you do is you stir up the snake to come back and attack. No, no, no. You're not going to defeat sin with a few gentle, easy strokes. You're going to have to follow through and press on after it until you're sure that you have put it to death. Now, here's a very important distinction. We've been seeing in this session that the impulse to sin remains in you. But here's something that's really important to grasp from the Bible. Though the impulse to sin remains in you, its power no longer reigns over you. Paul says, 
Sin will have no dominion over you. And for that reason, he says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. You see what he's saying? Sin doesn't rule, so don't let it rule. When you're in Christ, sin is no longer your master. The impulse to sin remains in you, but it does not reign over you. Dr. Jim Packer says that sin has been dethroned, but not destroyed. I like to say it this way. Sin will always be your enemy, but it is no longer your master, and God has equipped you to put up a fight. So win some battles in your war against the flesh. I didn't say win the battle, because this is not a battle that you fight once and then it's over. No, sin dies slowly and the battle continues. But here's the really good news. Progress is possible. And as you engage in this battle, you will grow. You will prevail over the sin and temptation that has often defeated you in the past. Think about the battle against sin in your life as a warfare in which you develop a position. Every time you say yes to a sin, you increase its power in your life. And every time you say no to a sin, you weaken its power in your life. Now, I like to use the analogy of American football. It's all about moving the ball forward. And think about how that game's played. Even when you are gaining yards in a drive, you can never rest. Because when you think you're doing really well, sin can snatch the ball and be down in the end zone before you even know it. And then think about this. The time when you have put points on the board is the time when you most need to be on your defence. Now think about your ministry. You've been exerting yourself in serving. Maybe you've led someone to Christ. The Lord's blessing your ministry. Watch out! When your ministry is moving forward, sin's going to be coming back at you. And then remember this. When sin has broken through your defence and scored a touchdown against you, you don't give up. When you've failed, that's the time when you need to begin a new drive against sin in your life. So if you've been discouraged by defeat, if you've been overwhelmed by temptation, I want to encourage you with the words of Micah chapter 7 and verse 8. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. If you're discouraged, by the ongoing battle that you have with particular sins and temptations, let me encourage you again with this quotation from Bishop Ryle. He says, A true Christian is one who has not only peace of conscience, but war within. He may be known by his warfare as well as by his peace. You see what he's saying? The fact that you're in a battle is a sign that you really are a true believer. The mark of a true believer is not only an awareness of peace, it's also an awareness that you're in a battle against sin. So in your battle against sin and temptation, here's how you move forward. Know it, stalk it, and kill it. Well, I hope you'll join me next time for session five of Watch Your Life. We're going to be looking then at exercising faith.